Thank you, Amin, for um, this wonderful introduction. And um, it's great to be sharing this platform with my husband. Um, this is incidentally um, our first project, our first book project together. With great difficulty. <laughs> With great difficulty. Um, Raghu has been nudging me for several years to work on, to write a book on Darbar Sahib. And I said, look, I can't start with the most complex site and site which is so precious. Uh, I can't start my writing with the most important site. It has to be something slightly simpler to work with. But not that Amritsar was any simple. But um, anyway, so we're delighted to share our uh, first uh, book project. And I'm so glad it is Amritsar. Um, and it's a chance happening that uh, we got down to doing this book. And um, I must uh, credit uh, the government of Punjab and government of India for uh, supporting, uh, for um, making of this book, because I was involved in a project uh, in Amritsar for the last five years, which was um, funded by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs under a program called RIDE, which is uh, looking at, there were 12 historic cities um, that were identified across the country, which are, which are sacred cities. And I, through a competitive process, um, I was awarded this project in the year 2015 to work on the urban level intervention on historic buildings and infrastructure around historic sites. And towards the end of the project is when the government decided that we could do a publication. And it took a couple of, you know, morphed into different forms. And uh, finally, it took, they said they wanted to do a picture book. And that's how we got started. We were awarded this work early last year. And then, of course, came COVID uh, lockdown in March. And that's when I, you know, uh, in fact, interestingly, Raghu got to, you know, he was getting very restless because he wanted to immediately go back to Amritsar and shoot. And I, it was towards early March that he said, look, I'm going and you can take your time, but I'm going to Amritsar. So he went off to Amritsar, photographed Amritsar for about a week, came back into Delhi around the 20th. And then it was on the 24th of March when we had the lockdown. So he was able to capture Amritsar last year by this particular, you know, getting to the site, kind of getting to the place. There are a few special aspects that you had mentioned me to look into. I think he was feeling a little out of depth because he hadn't visited the sites which I had conserved. So he thought he must go and look at them, you know, and for some reason he had a sense of urgency. So he went off to Amritsar to photograph. And then through the lockdown, through this pandemic, in fact, I, had to cut off from a lot of friends and relatives, you know, no phone calls, no conversations, because I had to immerse myself into the city. And the city was so overwhelming in spite of years and years of work and heritage. I needed to just, you know, we spent some time together at, at the farm. You know, we have a farm outside Delhi. And all I did was just sat with my books, sat with my, you know, myself, and years and years of work in heritage conservation. In fact, my engagement with the city of Amritsar has been since 1919, um, I would say 1999. Yeah, um, since for a, 2000 was when I started working. You know, I was, in fact, earlier. Um, I got concerned about certain conservation issues a, a bit earlier and began working on, um, the nomination dossier for inscription for inscribing Harmandir Sab uh, into the UNESCO World Heritage List. So that was something which we talk about in the book. So it's been 20 years of engaging with the city and with the heritage of the city, with uh, Harmandir Sab, the setting of Harmandir Sab, the walled city, to several other monuments. And I'll talk about it in, as we go through. So I would, um, so that is the context of what led to making of the book. And um, so I will, uh, we will, I have a short presentation to walk you through uh, the way the book flows and some of the images, but there are very few images because we would like you to actually get your own copies. So I'll start, start sharing the screen right away.
So is that visible? Um, is my screen visible? For me, that looks lovely. Thank you. I can see the full screen of the jacket and the opening title page. Okay. So um, I must, this has been, um, this is what the book looks like. And in fact, I got my first copy. I'm sitting in Mumbai. I got my first copy today. So this is, unfortunately, looks right side left, but the book is with me right here. It was, I mean, it's very precious and it's looking really beautiful. But anyway, so uh, this is what the book looks like. And I must credit my young daughter, our young daughter, Purvai Rai, who's a graphic designer and an artist. And she's the one who's done the design. And um, I mean, we were looking at a whole lot of photographs for the cover till, um, and what you see here, the image is when Rahu went to, um, Harmandir, uh, to Amritsar in March last year, he actually worked very hard to get the permission to have a drone fly over Harmandir Sahib because we had several years ago, you know, both of us had been on a helicopter around Harmandir Sahib and he'd taken the aerial photographs and some of them are in the book itself. But this time he was very keen to have a drone fly and I was wondering why he was so keen to have that. And, and he, I mean, there are some drone images of Harmandir Sahib in the book as well. And this image is from uh, the drone, um, uh, the photographs taken by the drone. And then when Purvai kind of looked at the greens of the water, you know, the blues, greens of the water and thought of this as a, the background to be that color, the cover to be that color with this inset of the drone image, we thought this was such a perfect way, you know, to, to talk about, you know, the city, um, you know, this is the seed of, which led to the growth of the city. Um, of course, what this was resonating with us is also one very important uh, miniature, which is in, I think, Kapani collection, which is, uh, I'm sure you can, you'll recall um, that this kind of resonates that particular image of that particular painting. The book is dedicated to Ram Daspur, and this itself was quite, um, you know, I mean, every moment in the book, because you know, I mean, for the first time I realized that what does writing do when, you know, it was such a catharsis for me. It was my personal journey of 20 years engaging with conservation and conservation with my heritage. I would say my heritage, yeah. And, you know, I've grown up as a Punjabi, as a Sikh um, in Punjab, going there, you know, I used to live outside, but visit Punjab every summer, every winter. My father was a very proud Sikh. And we grew up, you know, with the Bani and at home and, you know, um, a lot of practices are of the faith in our family. Uh, for me, it was to do heritage conservation has never been just as an architect, you know, with the tools of conservation. It's been a very, very personal journey, a personal journey of self-discovery, of understanding what do these symbols of faith mean to our community. Uh, some personalized and some, and where does that personalized, what is this memory in the DNA of the Sikh community? You know, I mean, I, um, and you realize that a lot of references, whether it's fairs and festivals or listening to Bani sometime or a certain practice or certain engagement or certain, you know, uh, even if, you know, fest, um, occasions of, festivities or celebrations in the family, like a wedding, you know, you kind of, for me, conservation as a practice has been a very, very, you know, it's a, it's been a very personal journey because there have been some references which have been in one's growth from childhood. So it's not an acquired sensibility with some sort of, you know, so the tools of conservation were, I mean, they were literally tools, but the cultural nuances go deep into my, you know, growth as, uh, you know, from a young child. What was very unique about doing the book is that literally, I mean, I was very overwhelmed. I was very humbled that, you know, I hope I can do justice to what I felt and experienced over so many years. But, you know, whatever I could recall in terms of experiences, this book does more than that. In fact, I was looking at it today and I said, look, I couldn't have produced this, you know, because for some reason the experience was very immersive. 
but um, also I could see that there was there was something very you know the universe the universe was blessing me with this, and why when I when you see this dedicated to Ram Daspur and this piece of writing from Guru Granth Sahib, which says Amrit Sar Satgur Satvadi Jitna Te Kawa Hansove. I came across this and I couldn't believe what I was reading here, you know, that how Amrit Sarovar itself is for me, how, what it meant was that Amrit Sarovar is actually your guru and your guru who is the truth. And when you immerse yourself into the guru, it is even a crow that kind of, you know, blossoms into, into a swan. So. Amrit Sarovar being the guru in which you immerse yourself. Now, this itself was huge for me. When I came across this particular quotation, I mean, this particular piece of writing, I couldn't believe what the guru was telling me, you know, about Amrit Sar. And, you know, I have been going into Amrit Sar again and again and engaging. I have had the good fortune of engaging with Harmandir Sab uh, on various different you know, initiatives. Uh, a lot of them were my, I was being very, very, you know, adventurous also somewhere because very ambitious that, you know, this whole thing about nominating Sri Harmandir Sahib as a World Heritage Site, what it meant for me, why I thought it was, I still believe that it is such an important place for, you know, um, uh, for us to, uh, you know, bring out the, the, the highlights of what does this site mean to mankind, to humankind today? And that was the whole reason for it. But even while I was doing the nomination dossier, I did not, this particular nuance, this particular depth of experience and understanding did not reveal to me at that juncture, which came upon, you know, during this particular experience. Now, how did this book come together? Uh, what for me as a heritage practitioner, as a Punjabi, as somebody who's engaged with the various layers of history and different aspects of the cultural narrative of the city of Amritsar, um, there, were, there was something very important that knowingly or unknowingly, consciously, subconsciously, that one was trying to achieve here. I was very keen that we need to be able to, I need to be able to ex express to the reader to the initiated as well as to the uninitiated, somebody who's interested in the city of Amritsar, is that how do you read a city? And how do you read a heritage of a community? Is buildings enough to, is buildings only brick and mortar? Is it something to be, uh, you know, repaired and become a tourist attraction? Or if you alter a building, does it alter something for a people? Um, are people, uh, writers, poets, authors, what have their contribution been in terms of making of a community? What does literature do in terms of uh, the minds and in terms of forming the direction of, of uh, um, community? Events, is event something that happen only at, in t at a place at, in a particular time or is there more to it? And do, do, does that significance of that particular event come back to you again and again and again as time passes? Um, all of this in our, in my, what I was trying to do in this book is that to explain the 500 years, almost 500 years of the history of this particular city, this very important city, um, to walk those 500 years and use different tools and techniques and references to explain the cultural and the historical nuance and which together becomes the collective memory of a people. And I do believe that some people are able to consciously speak about and some of it is in your DNA. And that is what forms, you know, um, a city and a people. I personally invited a um, uh, few people who I knew were aware, you know, kind of um, specialists in a particular subject. For instance, if I were to walk you through the various chapters in the book, 
Um, the, the first chapter is about Sri Harmandir Sahib, the nerve center and the making of the city. So it literally, it's like a complete journey from inception to um, the current times. Um, you know, so it walks you through the site, um, its evolution, the architecture, symbolism, and then uh, about the city from the Guru period, subsequently to the Missal period, to Mahara, period of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, then under the British rule, and then the, the contribution of the events that happened, um, you know, all the way up to uh, present times. The second chapter is about labor, economy, and spirituality, because I do, you know, I do believe that um, how pilgrimage centers um, contribute and how economics are and um, labor, especially in the case of, I do believe in the Sikh faith, uh, when we talk about engagement with the site, because, you know, this whole thing about paid labor, seva, the concept of that, as well as looking at the same thing from um, the international le lens of um, what does it mean about uh, um, engagement with a sacred site and making of a city. Um, that is this particular essay is written by Dr. Pritam Singh, um, Oxford University. The third one is about Gobinger Fort. Now, Gobinger Fort, to my mind, represents, I mean, what uh, Lord Dalhousie, Marcus um, Dalhousie says um, that it is probably the key to Punjab when Punjab was the last state that was annexed to um, first the East India Company and then subsequent in 1849 and subsequently, um, you know, under the crown, the British crown. So what is what the making of the fort, the location of the fort, the role of the fort, um, during the times of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and how it evolves with the French influence, what Maharaja Ranjit Singh was doing in his 30 years or, you know, 38 years of ruling, um, you can see that what was happening, I mean, it literally it becomes a keyhole in terms of understanding the, the geopolitics of the area, of the region. And subsequently, when the British take over, how does the, the uh, fort um, change? and what all do gets done to the fort and subsequently its conservation today. Um, while labor, economy and spirituality more or less looks at the earlier part of, you know, the conceptual level of looking at the city, Gobindgar is more about the 18th and the 19th century. Um, the other monument that I talk about after that is the Rambag Garden. And uh, if you were to look at this page on your left, left of this particular uh, the table of contents, Ramba Garden is right here where 134 is written. And Harmandir Sahib is right here within the wall city of Amritsar. Uh, the Gobindgar Fort is here to the left. Now, these are the two very important edifices of the historical edifices of the city, other than Harmandir Sahib, it sits, you know, kind of nestled in, in this whole the wall city. And this is where Maharaja Ranjit Singh comes and lives here. He creates his summer palace and this is his residential area, whereas this is his military, uh, you know, uh, post, which actually is built to protect the wall city of Amritsar. Now, how this gets transformed um, when the British take over and this chapter is about uh, transforming an edifice as an act of subjugation. And this is this idea I even got when I worked on the management plan of the Red Fort in Delhi, that how willfully monuments are transformed as, you know, I would say as acts of violence. Um, and how, you know, how this suddenly from Ram Bag, it becomes the company bag and people call it company bag even today. And company is just, mind you, it was only seven, eight years of the British of East India Company. In spite of that, Rambag name gets overwritten by Company Bag, and how the whole site transforms with clubs and such like, and even um, it's used during uh, the first part of the 20th century uh, to even um, uh, you know when the the jails were not adequate and people were getting arrested. They were actually getting bound to trees here within the Ramba Garden because Ramba Garden becomes part of the cantonment. 
so that was that's the second chapter which talks about you know because you get to see the british period through the transformation of this particular building and making of new institutions of governance the municipal corporation gets made and so on so this monument becomes you know a way to look through this you can see a particular period of the city after that I, the chapter is on bhai ram singh and we uh, i mean i invited uh, sajida uh, wonderland pervez wonderland sub from uh, in pakistan in lahore because they are um, authorities on bhai ram singh and uh, bhai ram singh bhai ram singh is somebody i admire greatly because i think he truly represents the art and craft movement you know the dignity of labor and uh, this is kind of very different from the other company schools that were set up and bhai ram singh was the first principal he was a carpenter who becomes who is a designer artist architect and he becomes the architect of the queen but is treated as a servant of the raj and this name is something which sajida wandel and praveen wandel gave this i mean I, i to me this was giving me really uh, you know kind of um, a hit to the you know in my solar plexus you know to be labeled this but this is exactly what was happening at that period and um, and of course there were sympathizers there is lockwood kipling uh, who's uh, you know who found who is the first principal of the mio college of art in lahore and how ram bhai ram singh is an apprentice under him and what he contributed significantly in terms of you know giving dignity to to these artisans um, you know who then also got their recognition but but on an institutional level um, you know there was much to be desired uh so through him we get to see a certain work ethic a certain uh, type of architecture and uh, it's a social statement as well about how uh, you know i mean if you think of it punjab is a place where there is dignity of labor that's one of the founding principles of the sikh faith and then you have bhai ram singh who is a carpenter who gets a certain amount of recognition quite a bit of recognition but that this colonial instruments are instruments of subjugation and so there's this contradiction but yet the man comes out of it with such amount of dignity uh, it's a very very interesting um, you know way of looking at um, the uh, the times this book would not have been complete without uh, a chapter on uh, jallianwala bag and that's when i invited amandeep um, aman and uh, paramjit to contribute and because i'd looked at their book the the absolutely amazing um research work that they've been doing you know for so many decades and the fact that it links jallianwala bag to the you know almost like to 1857 and the memory of 1857 to the contribution of the punjabis in the world war 1 uh, and subsequently what leads into the happening of 1919 and 1919 jallianwala bag was amritsar was not the only city that experienced it directly you know people talk about a thousand people because you know i mean why was it such a big deal and then you realize it wasn't just amritsar the entire punjab was under curfew and the whole country the whole um, subcontinent was looking at punjab when it came down to the to the freedom movement and how important jallianwala bag is in the whole narrative which is not understood by people that it's the entire punjab that was burning and it you know and what amritsar and within that the epicenter was amritsar um so from there we lead to the writers artists and thinkers of that time and i think that is something where unfortunately you know people feel that punjab has or at least there seem to be a uh, popular saying that there is no culture in punjab but agriculture and this is what i feel that we punjabis also laugh at this particular quotation and i think we undermine our heritage hugely because the richness of our vernacular and um and the contribution and the complexity i mean amritsar with the punjabi sikh writers between nanak singh gurbaksh singh and you know a whole lot of others then you had a formative years of faiz ahmed faiz in amritsar and sadat manto i mean i you know all these people were there in amritsar and you realize that how much they were how you know so the 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 literary tradition the artistic tradition it wasn't something which was on the periphery it was very very 
much anchored in the, the continuity, the tradition of, of uh, the, the land and how they all coexisted. Nothing was more important or less important. So this chapter, this essay by Nadia Singh um, is a glimpse into the writers, artists and thinkers of, of Amritsar. Subsequently, then, of course, comes the partition. And we, I requested Urvashi Butalia, who's uh, a very renowned uh, um, writer and researcher who's been uh, working on partition because her, pers her family was personally impacted. Uh, I think her, her mama um, stayed back in Pakistan while the rest of the family migrated uh, at the time of partition. And she's, been, she's researched the partition since, I think, maybe the 70s or, you know, or even earlier. And Urvashi has done a beautiful personal piece in terms of her interaction with a family in Amritsar. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it gives you goose skin in terms of her experience meeting with this man. I mean, just a little snapshot that she meets, you know, with great difficulty, uh, she meets uh, a, a man here in, the, in, in Amritsar who was known to have murdered or killed or whatever you, I don't know, sacrifice. I don't know what word you would use. 17 members of his family as they fled from Pakistan when Pakistan was, was formed into Amritsar and how she was, she didn't know what to expect that she was going to meet a murderer. So, you know, and a gentle human being that she meets and this man who lives with that trauma all his life and uh, what it means. And so her experience of partition through life, through few families and leading up to um, memorialize, memorializing trauma and other contested uh, sites of similar nature across the world. And, um, you know, I must say that all the chapters, I was urging all the writers uh, to think about that, look, this is the narrative, but you don't want to close at the past. You want to say something about the future. You want to say something about the present. There has to be hope. There has to be, uh, you know, um, that's how I got this, you know, got the inspiration of calling the book A City in Remembrance, because we are recalling our history, our culture. We're engaging with its physical fabric today, which becomes your keyhole to look at your past. But all chapters, all essays actually look into the future. And Subsequent to this, um, the, and in fact, what was very satisfying for me was that when somebody who's a mentor to me in heritage practice is uh, um, uh, Dr. Richard Engelhardt, I um, mean, he's an um, archeologist, anthropologist, and he used to head UNESCO um, in Bangkok. Uh, he was uh, the regional advisor for the Asia and the Pacific for the longest. When I'd actually requested uh, uh, Dr. Richard Engelhardt for a, a quote, you know, for the book. And he looked at, you know, he spent a few days reading the, you know, the, the manuscript. And he wrote a beautiful piece of about 500 words and he called it, um, uh, let me just, I mean, I don't want to say an epiphany of new dreams, that's what he calls it. He says an epiphany of new dreams because what he saw in Raghu's pictures and in the text that has been put together here, he could see that there are new dreams for the city. And it, we would do completely injustice to Amritsar if he only spoke about its historical and cultural narrative that froze in time and just looked at the past and cannot see inspiration for the future. And so I so we so we asked. He said, you know, use it the way you want to use it. So we use it as a, as a forward because clearly he sees a future. And after this particular piece on partition, that's when we start talking about conservation. And I requested Dr. Jigna Desai, who is uh, the head of the conservation department in uh, the school uh, in Sept University in Ahmedabad. And um, she writes about this and she has not been to Amritsar. And I couldn't believe what a beautiful piece she put together. And she called this a city that doesn't forget. 
And this had nothing to do with me as a Punjabi trying to tell her and all that. She did her thorough research. And she looked at the entire process of conservation recovery, something which we understand under conservation. She looked at Operation Blue Star and the whole story about the reconstruction efforts, the rebuilding twice over of the of Sri Akal Taksal. And how as an outsider, I'm purposely using the word as an outsider, as a heritage practitioner, as a cultural heritage, you know, um, person, how does she look at, I mean, look at this whole, the way communities have engaged with their sites again and again. And she puts this, this whole piece together, uh, mapping um, past instances to current times in terms of conservation and regeneration. Subsequently, the next chapter is something which a project that we enjoyed doing in Amritsar as part of the Hriday program where we restored the only surviving gate from the 18, from the 19th century, the only surviving gate of Maharaja Ranjit Singh's period called the Ramba Gate. And that's located here where it is 228. And because this is the route that Maharaja Ranjit Singh would take uh, to go to Harmandir Sab. And he would come from here and, you know, follow this particular Ramba Gate Road, this uh, Ramba Bazaar goes from here, cuts across, there was no uh, Hall Bazaar. It goes perpendicular to Hall Bazaar, goes towards the Guruka Bazaar and through Darshni Diori, it kind of um, goes towards Harmandir Sab. And that was the route that Maharaja Ranjit Singh would use. And following, so we, and there's a whole community of people around the Ramba Gate and these people were rehabilitated there after they moved here from uh, on the creation of, you know, at the time of partition. And so this whole bazaar is called the Rambag Bazaar. So when you would talk to these people about the Rambag Gate, for them, you know, you said, what is about the heritage? And their heritage was Pakistan, you know, that we came from Peshawar or we came from Lahore or something. And very little association with this particular gate. They refer to the gate as a killer. And what they recalled was that during the 1980s, this particular gate was the interrogation center during the, you know, the militancy period in Punjab. And they remember sounds of torture and, you know, um, coming out of this building. And when I first saw it in 2007, it was a police station. And it took a bit of an effort at that point to get, request the police station to move out of this building and we had done a bit of structural restoration at that point because there was limited resources but under the Hriday program we were able to have dialogue with the community all around and bit by bit you know chipping at the block um we did a we undertook a bit of an urban renewal program around the gate restored the building and made it into um, a community museum which we call as a Lok Virsa and towards the end of it is the last chapter is that which I call uh, towards principled conservation revitalization. This is my learning. learning. I mean, I did not know how I was going to close this whole um, you know, narrative. And this actually uh, essay is my learnings and experiences over the last 20, 25 years of engaging with heritage conservation in the, in the state in Punjab. And I would say that I feel very good about this chapter because I feel that I've, we've really decolonized conservation when in this chapter and we actually find our strength in cons conservation processes and I feel we need to go back to the tradition of Seva, Gurmata and the wisdom in the Bani to be able to find the rightful uh, vocabulary for sustainable development why we look at our cultural heritage both tangible and intangible and it's not just cultural it's cultural and natural heritage and I think our answers lie with our traditional wisdom and I do believe that this is you know um, um, the decolonized tools for conservation and uh, so I feel it's been you know truly a blessing um, I mean, I don't have the wisdom to put this together, really. I was looking at the book today and I said, look, I have not put this together. Uh, it's been a most beautiful and enriching experience. And, um, and I really am very excited to share it with the rest of the world and um, uh, the way we've understood. Also, and also, you know, your uh, 
realization of Harki Pauri and uh, Harki Pauri at Harmandir Sahab and Haridwar. You must tell them, share that. No, I will share with this subsequently, but I would now like you to speak about your engagement with Amritsar before I maybe give them some glimpses and some little, if time permits, a little bit more about, you know, the experience. Yeah. So over to you, Mr. Rai. Well, hello, hello to everybody. <laughs> Basically, primarily, it's Meeta's book. The name because is Gurmeet Rai. Gurmeet Rai. <laughs> <laughs> because she's been working in Amritsar on various projects for the, over more than 20 years. And me, if anybody asked me to do, spend a few maybe two weeks or three weeks in any town or any place or any subject, I only think of doing a book. Because book is a very enriching experience in the sense it's like making a film on the subject where, where so many possibilities come together in telling the story in the most powerful way. So primarily it's Gurmeet's book supported by my pictures in the sense that uh, Amritsar has, has been very important to my soul in the sense that I feel Harmandir Sahab is maybe one of the two, three holiest places in the country. And even when uh, the militancy was on the rise and I was working with India today, we used to go once a month to Amritsar, to Harmandir Sahib, because Bindran Wale with his men used to sit on top of uh, the, uh, you know, that uh, uh, building next to Harmandir Guru Nanak Bhavan, yeah. Guru Nanak Bhavan. <coughs> so, <coughs> and even when the militancy was at its peak, and you could see so many young men carrying guns inside Golden Temple. The fact is that, you know, once I have done my photographs of Bindan Wale and his men and other people in the complex, you close your eyes and you touch the heavens. So Bindan Wale ke zamane, maybe it was a blessing to be at Harmandir Sahib. And then that was the time when I was also photographing the city very extensively because he, gradually he was getting support from other parts of uh, Punjab also and people turning up, staying in different parts of city. So here in this photograph, you can see, you know, this must have been taken in early eighties, you know, when they were, you know, doing some conservation inside Harmandir Sahib. So my relationship with Amritsar and Harmandir Sahib is very deep. And also maybe I knew then, 20 years before I met my wife, that I'm going to be marrying a sick lady. <laughs> so it was a very futuristic connection that I had made with Harmandir Sahib and a very precious place. And every time I go there, I long to be there. The energy, the spirit, you walk in, and rub you know, this is the feeling I have, you know, which happens nowhere else in the country. So I have been photographing it for 40, 50 years now. And in fact, you know, the other project that now I'll be insisting that we should do together is a specialized book on Harmandir Sahib. And I've got such details and photographs and experiences being there that it's amazing for me. So this is part of my collection that you get to see as uh, uh, edited and selected by my own wife, Lady Gurmeet Rai. No, I didn't do the selection. Anyway, um, okay. So um, I would now quickly uh, run you through some of the images, I'm gonna have screen grabs of some of the essays. Um, So, so the book contains a lot of um, some historical archival material, and I must uh, thank uh, uh, the Vinder Tour for
for being so kind and gracious for sharing his collection with us. Again, the same challenges of lockdown and so on, but he was really, uh, he, uh, we were not able to get a lot of pictures that we had selected because libraries were closed and things were not accessible. Um, but um, this is really heartfelt thanks to him that he shared some of his uh, pictures. This is one of my, uh, you know, I like this picture. It looks like, you know, you could be in the 19th century or the 18th century. It's a photograph by Raghu Rai in his, I think this is um, probably taken last year. Um, I mean, you can collect, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought this cultural plurality of uh, the streets within the streets of Amritsar, you know, because people sometimes feel that, okay, it's a Sikh shrine, you know, Harmandir Saab, and you kind of imagine you'll find only Sikhs around or, you know, these kind of popular perceptions, um, common, you know, that a site is associated with a faith, so you'll only have people from that faith. But what is most unique, one of the most unique things about Harmandir Saab is that how the site resonates with people across all communities. And uh, I mean, it's not surprising that it kind of gets voted in as, you know, um, most visited place, even more than Taj Mahal or, you know, in the bucket list of people for to visit. Um, the, there's a whole collection of photographs, again, from last year, uh, because, I mean, I've been, I had to, you know, I was telling Raghu that, you know, if you were to remove the roof from all the buildings and you kind of do an aerial photograph or drone of Amritsar, Literally every building is a karkhana. Everybody is productively engaged in producing something or the other. And, uh, you know, and of course the way in Indian cities you have that, uh, the front of your house or your shop becomes the area for production. It's not the backyard. And uh, this is what you get to see in some of uh, Raghu's pictures is how intense uh, the sights and smells and activity in, is, uh, you know, in the walled city of, of Amritsar. Um, one of the very interesting revelations to me in the course uh, of uh, authoring my essays, and I would say it was really a blessing for me. This is something which I had not uh, thought of earlier, that when I had worked on the nomination dossier of uh, Harmandir Sab, uh, uh, you know, there were stalwarts like Professor J.S. Garival and uh, Dr. B.N. Goswami and Jeevan Deol, all of them who I kind of sought their help to get insights into understanding Harmandir Sab in terms of ar architecture, embellishments, planning, and so on. And this is now 20 years, 2002 is when we engaged with the subject. And a lot of that information is kind of, you know, accessible to a lot of people, you know, the fact that Harmandir Sab is at a lower level, it's, you know, and um, references that analogies about fire going up and water going down, humidity going down. So, you know, Harmandir Sab built on a lower level and such like. I also had some insights related to embellishments in terms of taking reference from the art, you know, Arti of Guru Nanak Dev Ji in terms of, um, you know, uh, and looking at decorations and embellishments in, in Harmandir Sab from the descriptions of the glory, you know, in the glory of the creator. Um, but something very interesting happened during the course of this particular uh, work that, you know, I mean, I've always tried to, I always thought that what determined the orientation of Harmandir Sab in the planning? Because clearly when Guru Ramdas uh, Guru Ramdas Ji had the sarovar there. The sarovar would have had, you know, a soft edge. Now, when Guru Arjun Dev gave it a very definitive form to the water body with the steps and so on, he could have oriented it in any direction, you know. And to have Harmandir Sab facing kind of northwestern side, and um, you know, uh, it doesn't go with the temple architecture. It doesn't go with the mosque. It doesn't, you know, and the fact that, I mean, one is familiar that how, uh, you know, Sikhism as a social movement um, had the, the, uh, the inclusivity of, of the faith would have included much, everything, you know, and everybody into this whole, uh, you know, um, uh, what Guru Nanak Dev Ji's message was. Um, I decided, and I had a thought about Hadki Pori. 
and I was and I was also familiar that Haridwar, uh, the city on the Ganges, you know, that's a point at which uh, that's where the Kumbh Mela is going on in India right now. The point at which the um, you know the the river Ganga comes from the mountains into the plains. So it's literally like from uh, you know from the heavens and comes into the earth. So you've got these two mountains and the Ganges coming down, and there is a Harki Pori, which in the drawing is right here. And I went to Haridwar in September last year, and uh, by chance, and um, I took a walk along the Ghat across on this on the eastern, you know, um, the southeastern um, bank, looking at all these mansions of the traders and so on, until I reached Harki Pori and I went across the bridge and saw this Pori. Uh, this is this part is called Harki Pori, and I brought that information back to the office and to my studio. And I said, look, let me just check what the orientation of Harki Pori of Harmandir Sahib is and the Harki Pori of Haridwar. And I was completely taken aback that the orientation is identical. And this thought that I received, and I would use this word in all humility, it's what my sociologist professor says, that you don't generate thoughts, you receive thoughts, you know. And when I saw this orientation and I said, oh my God, you know, um, then it doesn't surprise me anymore because Guru Amar Das had done the Goindwal Sab Bauli at that point, which was, you know, the waters for, you know, people to do and take the dip together as a, you know, it was like social inclusion of all communities and all uh, subgroups within society, you know, rising above the caste system, what was a major, um, Bain of the of the Indian society at that point, and here Guru Arjun Dev takes it to you know the the next level and includes the what I say the Hindu faithscape into this particular the architectural planning of the place. I mean I and also at that point and you know I um, and I what. You know, so you have Harkipori, you have the bay uh, in one particular direction. But interestingly enough, the Guru Granth Sahib, the, uh, the, the, the Granthi uh, who is sitting behind Guru Granth Sahib and reading from the Guru Granth Sahib has got his back towards the Harkipori. He's facing in the opposite direction. So when you are bowing, when you're Matha Tequing, you're facing the direction of Harkipori, but the person who's reading from the Guru Granth Sahib has got his back towards uh, uh, towards. Uh, that particular direction but and there are doors in the when you see this particular image the, this drawing this is the plan of harmandir sam and you see that this is what I, what is the prakash than which is a self illuminated space here's a section of harmandir sam with this cube under which you have the prakash right here and but there are four doors in all different directions you know this is a cube which is the perfect cube which houses the prakash than but you have doors in all four directions quite the knowledge, what has been communicated is exactly what, why we've used this image from uh, the Victoria and Albert, uh, Victoria Albert Museum collection is about the story of when Guru Nanak Dev Ji goes to Makkah and he demonstrates, you know, this, the presence, the omnipresence and the presence of uh, the, the Akal Purk in all different directions. And that's exactly what happens in Harmandir Sahib that while it is or or oriented towards the same Harki Pori as Haridwar, which was, I would imagine, one of the most important pilgrimage places. Um, you know, the fact that the Kumbh happens there, I mean, this is a legacy from centuries and centuries. Uh, he has also demonstrated the omnipresence, you know, and um, in all direction. Now, this particular revelation to me was very, very special. And the other thing which was that came very interestingly, um, came my way, I don't know what other word, appropriate word to use, is a composition of Guru Nanak Dev Ji in um, Sri Rag, where he talks about, I mean, I, um, about, um, uh, I mean, I should come to the quotation and read from there exactly, uh, where he talks about uh, where, you know, that where people during Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time, when they do the renderings and the, the embellishments of Harmandir Sab, where do they get uh, their inspiration from? And when you look at Guru Arjun Dev, 
that where does he get his reference from in terms of the water body and the shrine and to hold the uh, and to hold the holy book inside and that particular composition is on pay on ang 17 of guru granth sahib where it says prab harmandar sona tisme manak lal moti hira nirmala kanchan koth risal that the palace of the Lord is so beautiful within it are the gems, rubies, pearls, and flawless diamonds. A fortress of gold surrounds the source of nectar. And in the next line, it says, Bin Pori, Garki, O Charaha, O Gur, um, Chara, Gur Har Tian Nihal. And how can I climb up to the fortress without a ladder? By mediating on the Lord through the Guru, I am blessed and exalted. And the subsequent line also talks about that the guru is the ladder, the guru is the boat, and the guru is the raft to take me to the Lord's name. And the guru is the boat to carry me across the world ocean. The guru is the sacred shrine of pilgrimage. The guru is the holy river. And in this, so one actually sees that what are the visual references that, um, you know, this Bani of Guru Nanak Dev Ji, that actually inspires the form that Guru Arjun Dev builds here as the architect of Harmandir Sab. And, you know, when I was doing the nomination doors here, it was, you know, there were a lot of refer references when I was talking to Dr. B. N. Goswami, there was about the, you know, the Jal Mehels, and there were other compositions of Baba Farid, about, uh, you know, um, uh, about the Jahaz and so on. But nowhere did we come across the composition of Guru Nanak Dev Ji at that point uh, that would have inspired this particular, um, you know, form, this architecture of the references. So, I mean, for me, this was great revelation. Um, talking about labor, economy, and spirituality, this painting of the 19th century in uh, the Binder uh, tour, uh, his collection, to my mind, uh, was most appropriate to explain what is this labor of love and seva. Uh, the chapter on Gobindgar Fort talks about transformation and it also gives you some visual references of from the time the fort was recovered or was gifted by the army, by the Indian army to the government of Punjab uh, with the effort of uh, Captain Amarinder Singh and some of us as his so foot soldiers and uh, how he got the fort and then it was restored. And this is what the fort looks like. Of course, there's some more things to be desired, but a great achievement for my lifetime to be engaged with the site for about 10 years in its restoration. Um, the transforming an edifice as an act of subjugation. This is a, a you know, reference. Uh, these drawings are drawings of CRCI, the, the organization I, I head. And the renderings are by this young artist, Barkha Gupta. And um, uh, there are, we talk about, this to my mind is a very, very telling image. This particular uh, drawing is, uh, I mean, these are double spreads from the book itself. And here you see the deformation of the, the Ramba garden into company bag. Um, this is um, a, a drawing of um, 1870s, if I remember correctly in the Royal Geographic Society. And this is a very, very important uh, piece of map, you know? I mean, it's a whole city's map. I've just extracted the one on, on the garden. And um, this is what we've been able to achieve with, you know, the edge definition with stub walls and pathways connecting these chhatris on the side. Some pathways we've been able to recreate over years of conservation effort, conservation of the summer palace. This is the road that leads up to Ramba Gate, which we've been able to restore. So bits and pieces, and these are these horrible three clubs, uh, which were brought in by the British and which clearly need to be relocated. And we talk about it in all earnestness. And, um, you know, that if we can't recover this very important palace of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, uh, where we celebrate the man and his contribution, but we can't even get his palace in order. I think it's shame on us, you know. And uh, it's an ASI protected monument. It's protected by the National Act. But in spite of that, we are so helpless, then it says a lot about us, you know. Uh, I say it in so many words. No, I don't say it in so many words. I'm a little politer in the book. Um, 
this is what uh, this of course is a panoramic image so it distorts it a little bit but you get to an idea of what these stub walls are connecting the chhatris towards the end and this is just an artist rendering trying to you know urge the government that we should get the char bag back in place why are we being so lethargic and non committal you know and this chapter on bhai ram singh is also is one of my favorites as well and um photograph by ragurai of khalsa college an architecture by him jallianwala bag by um which i've already mentioned and there's some of these telling photographs by my dear husband which almost feels as if it's the same time as when the jallianwala bag actually happened you know um it's like you know um anyway then this is the cover of uh, kuni vesakhi written by uh, nanak singh and um mr nadeep suri his grandson was kind enough to share uh, the cover the original cover which actually disappeared because it was uh, you know after the uh, in 1920 when he actually wrote this particular piece of writing it was banned by the british government and it was i think only in the 1960s or that they were able to get the cover from the ministry of home government of india of home affairs to uh, actually get the the cover and um this is um, an important one talking about writers and um, poets the photograph of fez ahmed fez is taken by my husband and the one on top is of manto sadat manto with his grandfather taken in amritsar shared by his daughter and um the others are shared by different family members these are shared by uh, mr suri uh, of nanak singh and uh, gurbak singh preetlari shared by um, their family members the chapter on partition memory and memor memorializing and uh, with some of these pictures from the partition museum then of course A, a city that doesn't forget conservation regeneration processes in amritsar these are pictures by um, ragurai and you know in the eyes of the people you actually get to see you know from little young eyes to older eyes I and mean, if you care to look into them you kind of understand what is the emotion that is running in so why reconciliation and engaging with heritage is very important and i think germany has shown us some very very interesting ways and there have been a lot of the the you know the the coalition of sites of conscience or the peace parks that have been done worldwide um like the hiroshima peace park or uh, the memorial to the murder jews of europe the kind of sites that have been created worldwide to commemorate some of these sacrifices and how people have reconciled you know how acknowledging is so important recognizing is so important the contribution of the community to to the larger national narrative um i think it's so so critical because it's not just about the people from the community recognizing itself it's when the other chooses to recognize as much as we need to as need to recognize um you know other communities i would imagine the contribution of the punjabis or the sikhs to this whole narrative needs to be recognized on a larger shared platform and i think this is this is very very important some of these pictures this is 1984 um and look at the expression i think every face needs to be looked at you know what is the human emotion um that is happening with these events and these sites and the, these photographs um the chapter on ramba gates i mean what typically happens you know with all these toilets and things like that i mean this is what how the apathy we have towards built heritage because it looks like a pile of bricks and mortars you know um but it definitely means more and i hope we kind of become sensitive towards each other and you as time passes of course it got restored and uh, as a museum and we even demonstrated certain activities you know what you see at the back is is an installation by a uh, a designer and my daughter purvai they kind of put together manish arora and and purvai rai and uh, moshmi chatterjee who's uh, the author of this particular essay uh, this particular um, uh, uh, chandelier was created with kaliras and churas and malas of weddings uh, created in 
in the, the streets of Amritsar and it became quite an attraction. You know, it's been hanging there for two years and it looks as if it's as new as ever, you know, it became a selfie point for Amritsar. Um, and that's the last bit towards principled conservation and revitalization and epiphany of new dreams. And I do hope that um, this book actually helps us to, you know, I mean, for me, it's been a lifetime of work uh, with no moments of regret. And I do hope, uh, I feel very happy about it that I've been able to capture more or less uh, some my experience and my understanding and feeling towards what it means to be engaged with, uh, with uh, material culture. And I do hope the next generation is ready to take this work forward. Um, some reassuring comments, because this is something I just thought, I said, let me write to a few people and see what do they think? Am I only too excited? And, you know, I'd actually drawn a complete blank, you know, when we put the manuscript together. And then we um, sent it across to a um, uh, few people. And I would like to draw your attention to the publishers here. And of course, right in the center is the Municipal Corporation of Amritsar and Om Books International and Ragurai Foundation for Art and for Arts and Photography. They collaborated as the co-publishers and uh, this, um, these are the people, these are the organizations to be thanked. Um, and a few people who I did uh, send uh, the book to, one of course was to William Darlimple, the other one was to Dr. Nikki Gunindar Kaur Singh and then to Jeffrey Ward. This is across continents, you know, and Rahul Mehrotra and uh, got their comments. And these are, this has been used in the jacket. And uh, it makes me feel, you know, first we were going to write a, a short introduction to the book at the end at, at, and on the end cover. But when these, um, uh, you know, comments or whatever reviews came um, or recommendations came, I just thought that their comments actually adequately you know, talk about the book. So I really don't have to give a description about the book in the flyer. So thank you so much. And um, oh, and I think I've spoken. Thank you. Thank you, Gurmeet and Raghu. Thank you very much. Raghu, have we still got you there? Or did we, did we lose you? Ah, oh, you're back. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gurmeet. There were some goosebumps during that uh, talk. That um, that story about Harki Bari in particular is just, is just absolutely extraordinary. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Everyone, we've been talking about Gurmeet and Raghu Rai's new book, Amritsar, A City in Remembrance. If you wanna get access to the book, if you're in India, if you're lucky enough to be uh, in India, you can get it from Orm Books International or the Orm Bookshop International. And then the email that accompanies this, um, this talk, you'll, you'll get details about that. If you're in the UK or Canada, and I know a lot of you are, drop me an email, you'll see my email in the, in the chat tab, drop me an email um, and we're gonna figure out the logistics in the background. Raghu, can I put a question to you, please? Uh, I mean, can I just say one, one comment here? Uh, the book is also gonna be available on Amazon at some point, maybe in a week or 10 days or two weeks or whatever. The publishers are in, a, in, a, in the process of getting that done. So, but I'll make a post on the Facebook at that point, but... Yeah. Uh, writing to you would be very, very useful, I think. Yeah, and I, I spoke to your publisher, and that's why um, we're just going to gather yeah. some names and addresses. Oh, sorry, uh, names and details, uh, because it's going to take them a little while to get it over to the Amazon distribution site yeah. in the UK. It's all the boring logistics, but um, we just like to kind of capture your interest at this moment in time, and then we'll let you know when it's uh, when and how it's available. Uh, Raghu, the question I had was, you mentioned that you've been photographing Amritsar for, for decades. Uh, now, and I'm just curious how you made the decision of which images to select or not. And then the other question I had was, what did you do about that period of the 80s when, I mean, you have photographed some of the most iconic images, the, the go-to images of that period for Amrits. And I'm just curious how you handled that because it's, a, it's still a terribly sensitive issue. Yes, yes, it is. No, actually, in fact, uh, as I said earlier that once a month, I used to go to Amritsar for the update of the story and the 
Dindanwale's, you know, whatever process was happening. And when uh, the army surrounded Golden Temple. So, you know, we thought, you know, the action will take place tomorrow or the day after. We were waiting and no action was happening. And then I decided to sneak in. And I met one of the Bindan Wale's boys. And I said, I like to, I used to call him Paji, which his uh, supporters never liked. He said, he's not your Paji. He is a Sant. He's our Sant. You should call him Santiji. I said, no, he's my Paji. <laughs> so I, I contacted him. I said, no, you see, this is a serious matter <clears throat> now. And I like to meet him and photograph him. They said, impossible. I said, if it is impossible for me, who's been so close to him, then I'll be really defeated. Huh? So they looked at each other, they discussed it. Then they took me to the third floor of uh, Akalta. He was sitting there all by himself. And his eyes were really like red. And he says, I have been meeting you on a regular basis. Why can't I come and meet you? But I could see anger and fear in his eyes because he knew now he's being surrounded. Things are going to be difficult. So I picked up my camera. He was, Kanu, why are you taking pictures? I said, Paji, I have done it all these months. You know, you can't say no to me. I said, I've specially come to photograph you. So then he agreed, then I took the last picture. And, you know, then we were there for two, three days and no action was happening. I decided, and then I had friends in the army also. I asked them, they said, you know, it's very uncertain. When we get the orders from Delhi, we'll decide. So the day I left, next day I learned that they had walked into the Akal Tuk and they had grabbed them up. So I have very close and very powerful images of that time also. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is, as I said, Harmandir Sahib is Harmandir Sahib. It's the most you know, divine and gracious experience of that energy which gurus have left there. So, this aspect is very special to me. And, and, and of that whole range of images, a whole range of photography that you've done in the city and, and right up till, um, uh, you know, a year ago today, by the sounds of it, uh, how did you select them? What was your criteria for selecting what's going to go into the book and the, the story? My, my boss, you know my boss? <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she had it didn't happen like that. No, you did your selection, first selection yourself. Then I, I did a large selection and then I left it in front of her. I said, now it's entirely up to you because primarily this is your project. So she sat with me and she rejected half of it. Then, uh, you know, whatever pictures were left, then I looked at their chapters and the relevance of the photographs and then I knocked off a few more. And there it was, you know, whatever. <laughs> Normally, I have never done a book like this where it's 80, 70% is text and 30% are pictures. It's not like that. It's half and half. It's, it's a 280 page book, of which 120 is with the text and all that. Only. No, the only thing is we have archival photographs as well. And then, so maybe 100 are contemporary photos. Because you see, my wife has been telling me that it's not great moments captured by you all the time that will matter to this world. The text sometimes is very relevant and very important. So I said, Chalo, at the at they say. <laughs> so it's a very special book too. Harmanthi yeah. Sahib is going to be very, very special. Oh, I'm waiting for that to happen. 
Well, you can decide for yourself um, by getting, getting a copy of uh, Gramit and Raghu's uh, new book. As I said, just drop us a line and we'll, we'll help you get um, access to it. And Last I must say one thing, just to add, please. you know the cover picture. You see these miniature style of painting and Kapani collection has that, uh, you know, Hermander Saab's that view, which I have always loved. And how in olden days, you know, these miniature painters, they will simplify, minimize, and come to the point of form and texture and experience. So I literally, literally, when we were doing uh, drone shots of Harmandir Sahib, I made sure I copied it exactly. <laughs> That's a lovely idea that it's uh, it's inspired by those, those wonderful architect also. architectural pictures. Fabulous. Right. Let's 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 ask some questions from the audience. We've had two hundred and fifty people. Uh, online. Every, people that have been here before will know that if you just put your hand up on Zoom, which is a little button on uh, your Zoom screen, you can uh, ask your question live. Otherwise, lots of people have been asking questions on the Q&A function as well. So uh, this one I love. I love this uh, question from Robin Percival. Robin said, I went to Amritsar 22 years ago. And of course, most people on this call have been to Amritsar multiple times as well. He said, I visited the Golden Temple in Jallianwala Bagh, but can you suggest two other places uh, to visit if you go to Amritsar? So I'd like to ask both you and um, uh, Raghu that question. The old bazaars are very, very intense and beautiful. But I'll go back to Armandir Sahib again. Wash <laughs> <laughs> myself clean, you know. No, I agree with you, the old city. I mean, my, my daughter and I walked it for the first time, uh, I think we were there two years, three years ago. And yeah, it's an extraordinary passage back into time, but the industry is also fascinating as well. What do you look out for, Raghu, when you're walking the old city of? Actually, old city, you know, the lanes and by lanes are very intense. And the carigas, the carpenters, the pandavalas, the, the jewelry makers. Mano, you haven't shown that picture where there is a jewelry shop and garbage, you know, yeah, going on the other side, and, oh, a, and a Muslim and a Sikh. I mean, what a combination of elements we have. I mean, amazing moments they are there. You'll have to get the book for that. Gurmeet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gurmeet, two places in Amritsar are for you, special places? You know, uh, like I would say, if you would like to, uh, see the, um, you know, like Raghu said that if you were to walk the markets, you know, uh, of uh, the wall city, right around Harmandas, that's kind of very fascinating where the Maisema Bazaar is and the Guruka Bazaar and that area. Uh, other than that, I would say that you could even go to the Gobinger Fort is there to be, now it's open to public to go and see that fort. Ramba Garden exists as well under conservation though, right now not completed. But, um, you know, the thing is, or even the town hall. Now, of course, they've created that heritage street. So, um, I mean, I, I, it pedestrianizes that space. But uh, the town hall has something to tell you as well. Uh, so there are lots of bits and pieces. And I, it all depends on what you're looking for. For me, going back into those bazaars, like if you go early in the morning, or if you've gone for the, uh, you know, Palki Sab, the Sabari in the morning, and you kind of walk in the city and have your tea in the morning in the streets and all that's a different experience you go in a different time of the day it's a different experience you know yeah exactly and, as and I, you would also know it's um, sorry and amritpuri machi jalebiya desi choriya and all the tabas for the khana yeah yeah um yeah and as a historian of old of, of victorian photography the um, Patal Rai Burj, the Babatal Gurdwara. Babatal. That, that's where photographers seem to have taken some of the some of those the closest thing to a panorama to a um, a drone shot um, that was available in in those days. And I always find that a very peaceful and interesting place as well. Um, Gurmeet, the question about the the historic city wall of of Amritsar. Um, it's Theodbal asks the whole the old 
historic wall is in disrepair. What are, are your views on the lack of measures taken to preserve the old wall of the walled city? Uh, and what do you think the solutions are? You know, it's what they did was that, um, you know, when um, we've done restoration of a part of the wall. First of all, what I would say is that Maharaja Ranjit Singh's wall is a segment of it is uh, right behind the Ramba gate itself, on top of which is a printing press and a small uh, primary school for kids. So you get to see the ma how massive that particular wall used to be. So you get to see a segment of that. There are other areas like between Hall Bazaar and Ramba Gate that there are segments of the colonial period wall. We've restored part of it as well. Um, unfortunately, you know, if there was a certain will, it would be possible to restore many other segments of the wall as well, because, you know, the Municipal Corporation of Amritsar actually put about 700 shops along this particular edge, and they use the wall as the back. So towards the inside, you have a shop, so towards the outside, you have a shop. Now, any kind of commitment to recovering that particular edge would mean that government has to be very serious about relocation of these people, or identify a small segment, like I would say from Lahori Gate to Ramba Gate, at least create that part, you know, um, of the wall and the rest could, you know, if you can't achieve that as a matter. But there are ways to do it. We've actually given solutions on how to achieve this, but it requires a certain amount of commitment, you know, to really fix the urban heritage but also without making people, you know, without taking livelihood away from people. Mm. So this needs consultative, this needs to be done strategically, it needs commitment from the government, and it could have a business plan because there is a lot of government land available as well that one could do, you know, like they do it anywhere in the world, that you do your land, land bank and you relocate, have strategy for development as well as recovery of heritage. This can be achieved, but... Um, it needs consistent effort. Yes, and you talked about it at your last talk as well. Let me go to a couple of live questions and then we'll close because it's very late for you in, the United, in, in India, but I do appreciate you joining. Um, Shreya, Shreya Mera, can I ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question? There you go. Hello. Hello, hi Shreya, we can hear you. Hi, hi. Uh, so this is Shreya and I'm from Amritsar. I was, I, I was born here and I grew up here. So I was, while I was listening to the talk, while it's very fascinating, one thing that I felt was like, apart from the Sikh culture in Amritsar, there's a lot of Mughal history and other parts which sort of got skipped. So like in the outer parts of Amritsar, there's this Pulkanjari monument, which is from Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time period. And the calligrapher who did calligraphy on Taj Mahal has his Haveli and his like old Sarai in Amritsar, which is like not known at all in Amritsar. So there are lot, lots of like shackles out there. So I just felt like, you know, those were the things that can also be uh, spoken about from Amritsar. Shreya, the, the, for, uh, the place that you're talking about, Sarai Amanat Khan, it's on the old Mughal Imperial Highway called the Badshai Sarak, which is where the Mughal road was. And Amritsar was never on the Mughal road. And um, it actually, the Mughal road passed through Taran Taran and Chabal and Sarai Amanat Khan, Rajatal and towards Atari and into Lahore. So there are lots of Sarais and Kosmanars and all of that. So you're right. In fact, Gurus uh, built the city away from that Badshai Sarak. You know, uh, Guru Arjun Dev first did the, the Darbar Sahib in, in Taran Taran before he did Harmandir Sahib. So they moved, my understanding would be that they moved from the, you know, because this was a very important trading trade route. Yeah. So they moved up north, 22 kilometers and they establish near this particular new sarovar called the Ramdas Sarovar, where this was formed. In fact, Goindwal, where Guru Amar Das was, that was also on the Mughal road. And so was Sultanpur Lodi, where Guru Nanak Dev Ji was. But here, there was a deliberate effort to move away from the road. 
So I made a deliberate okay. effort to move away from the road as well. <laughs> so as far as Pul Kanjari is concerned, it's a water tank with a, you know, which is not a Mughal monument. It is a Maharaja yeah. monument. Uh, the idea here is to focus on the city of Amritsar. And, and yeah. it is not to look at the regional uh, context. Mm. This, then I, you know, it can go on and on. Maybe you can do yeah. a sequel on that one, you know. <laughs> that makes sense. And thanks a lot. Thank okay. you very much. Appreciate that. Let's um, let's do one more. Sam Samit Singh. Samit, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah. Good after. Uh, good evening, uh, Sister Kal. Um, thanks. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't sure if I can. I think it's about twenty years since I twenty nineteen years. I am listening to you, Gurmeet Raiji. The last one was the Heritage Festival in Amritsar. I think two thousand three or four when you presented and I was visiting my family, Dr. Kumtala. I think you know her, Amritsar Vikas Manj. But anyway, they have been making efforts. So I think continuing with the question she asked, and I think Raghu Raiji is here. My question is, yes, it's great that he is actually picturing everything from Harmandar Sahib. We can see all the old history too. But there is a lot of worry now about the walled city heritage. And I know you are doing a lot of projects. Are you optimistic? You already mentioned the corporation isn't doing a lot. Where will we stand in 15 to 20 years, you think? Are we going to lose all of it or there is any optimism still left <laughs> that we can save some heritage within the walled city? I mean, we know a lot of has been destroyed as well. Uh, I mean, what is your view on that aspect? And how we can conserve it? I mean, what is I mean, Amandeep, VG and everybody, they are doing a lot of efforts that we are already documenting this thing. Documenting is separate, but what effort needs to be done that these people, whether abroad or in India or in Punjab, we can save it on our, our end. Thank you. You know, the thing is, it is a very difficult uh, situation because the economics of heritage needs to be understood as well because you know it's all very well to tell somebody else that you know we must look, you must preserve your building and not be able to um, and without understanding the dynamics of economics of it all uh, a lot of so you know it's like you have to address the problem from two sides on one side you need to understand and empathize with the owners and what are the ground challenges you can't expect a person, you know, these houses are not easy to, to maintain, you know, these brick with mud mortars or lime plasters. You're in zone four, earthquake zone. These buildings need retrofitting. They need to be made safe. They need to be restored, but who's going to put the money there? The second part is, so one on one end, you've, you've got to understand the economics. And world over, wherever they have, fixed conservation or retain their heritage, they've understood the two sides of the coin. The second part is policy. We cannot have policy without incentivizing. You cannot say no, now you will continue to restore, but we will not provide any incentive for you and we are not going to help you do it. We're not going to give you technical know-how. We are not going to incentivize any which way. Now, then what will people do? Then you're actually giving them, then they hate the heritage. It's happening in other cities as well. They want to pull it down when, you know, pull something off so that in the middle of the night it collapses and then you get rid of it, you know. So we've got to understand that you cannot do heritage conservation without thinking through the pros and cons, the, the, um, what I've already mentioned to you. Uh, the commitment needs to come from the government. The commitment needs to come clearly because they are the ones who are going to do the policing and so on. They need to be committed to. They need to be committed to the idea of conservation and bring in the people who can help them crack different things. They need to incentivize conservation. Maybe like Ahmedabad has done transfer of development rights that you give, incentivize that you can't build more than three stores, three stories in the wall city. So if somebody's got a six six story a historic building, they'll never want to pull it down and make it into a three story building. They're doing it in Ahmedabad. Or if you're allowing a taller building, give them the rights to build outside. Let the owners be able to sell their property, uh, a floor outside in a modern part of the city where they can make money from. So what I'm saying is that we really need to think this through more critically 
this, you know, right now, I mean, if you are lethargic on that front, we're not going to have solution. And we've got to keep our spirit up. If you're going to keep our spirits down and be pessimistic, then of course it never starts anywhere. So optimism has to be the foundation to take this forward, you know. And uh, thank you very much, Gurmeet. And optimism is a great, uh, a great uh, comment to, to end on. I want to thank you both. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, Gurmeet, for joining us today. It's very late in India. We're all very conscious of that and we're very, very grateful to you uh, for joining us uh, today. Uh, it's been wonderful to be able to feature your, your new book um, at the book club today. And, I, and I'm sure that many of us will be interested in, in getting copies of it. So once again, Raghu and Gurmeet, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.